40 years ago in the labor room of an under-equipped country hospital in a faraway communist land. A smiling midwife was welcoming a tiny, whiny little thing into this beautiful world. It was Friday, from what I remember, it was already dark. So she could have uh, well said, uh, Happy Sabbath, Pastor Joe. She probably couldn't see the pastor in that tiny little thing. And most everybody had a hard time later on seeing it until it came out. I myself had uh, my dilemma, and when God finally could convince me that, yes, He was calling me in ministry, to ministry, I had a big question asking Him what He wanted to do with a stutterer. Did he need a stutterer preacher? Well, time passed. I became a pastor by God's grace, and I even developed a passion for preaching, for public speaking, for teaching. If you don't hear me stutter today, it's all because of him. One of the people that impacted my childhood and youth was a pastor that only had four years of formal education, four years, first, second, third, and fourth grade. And yet, he was one of the greater speakers, greatest speakers of that time. I had many teachers, many professors throughout my life up to this point, but I still believe he was the greatest among them. He's uh, now 80, just double of my age. He still is a mentor. But I remember one Sabbath when he was supposed to start an evangelistic campaign in the church of my childhood. At that time, he was not the pastor of our church. He was a guest speaker, and Sabbath evening, he was supposed to start the series. Sabbath morning, he preached for the church, of course. And at the end of the sermon, he gave a pretty lengthy prayer. A prayer in which he repeatedly would say things like, God Almighty, we sinned against you. Lord, we transgressed your law. Lord, we committed this. Lord, we committed that. And I remember the little child in me thinking, man, we really are sinners. Not only we are sinners, I'm not surprised about that, but this guy himself, what a sinner he is. He's just a sinner among sinners. What a sinner among sinners. Later on, I found out there is a prayer genre in the Bible called how? Intercessory prayer. That's what he was doing. As I was reading Daniel chapter 9 and rereading it several times, I was coming to the same conclusion again and again. What a sinner among sinners. I didn't know Daniel was such a sinner. But according to what he speaks about in chapter 9 in his book, he really was one, at least he made himself one of them. Because again and again, he comes back telling to God, we sinned, we transgressed, we did this, we did that. Let's pray and then go to it. Lord, this is a day of celebration for me. 
And I want to thank you for the privilege of standing in front of your people, bringing your message to your people. Lord, I want to thank you for every single person that somehow contributed to the history of my life, my family, my church family, your heavenly family. And Lord, as this morning we are looking at Daniel, a sinner among sinners, and how Jesus Christ the Messiah brings the solution for this situation. Lord, we pray that you will speak directly to each one of us through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The structure of Daniel chapter 9 is fourfold. It starts with confession, then it goes to petition. There's a response coming from God, and then a revelation is given to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 verse 2 says, in the first year of his, that is Darius's reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish how many years? Seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Seventy years. This prophecy made by the prophet Jeremiah should have made Daniel happy. He should be happy because now the 70 years are almost gone. He was among the first that were taken into captivity, and God told them through the prophet it was going to take 70 years. And I created a slide to show you how history and uh, the history of the exile in Iraq. Yes, the exile started almost 70 years ago compared to where Daniel is now. So I could tell him, Daniel, you should be happy. You are not too young now. He was close to 90 at this point. He may still have a chance to go back to his homeland. Daniel, you should be happy. Maybe you still have enough time to go home. But Daniel is not happy for a reason. Sometime prior, years before actually, he saw a very strange vision in which there was a section, and that vision is in chapter 8, in which somebody was asking, how long or until when? Ad matai. And the answer was 2,300 evening mornings. What does that mean? The Babylonian kingdom is now gone. Daniel is in the time of the Medo-Persian Empire. Yes, that kingdom of Babylon, that kingdom that took him captive, the kingdom that destroyed the temple of Jerusalem and Jerusalem, the city, is gone now. New perspectives, new horizons are open to this new kingdom. The time is almost up. The 70 years are almost gone. But in that vision, the one in chapter 8, and also in the one in chapter 7, he saw Babylon. Yeah, Babylon is gone. Medo-Persia, that's where we are at. But then there came Greece. And also another kingdom symbolized by a fierce, ferocious, wild beast like some sort of a dragon. And out of the horns of that animal came a little horn that would do terrible things. He would trample upon the saints and the sanctuary. And when he heard the question, how long? 
The answer was 2,300 evening mornings. What is that? Did God change his mind? So after the 70 years of exile, they are not going back home? It's going to take 2,300 what? Days or even years? So the worst is yet to come for his people, for God's people? Daniel chapter 9 verse 2, verse 3, it says, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests. He feels like he has to do something about this. He searched for him. How? By prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Those three components, fasting, sackcloth, and ashes, often follow when it's about prayer and supplication. But why prayer and supplication? What is prayer and what is supplication? Is prayer the same as supplication? What is supplication? Well, supplication is er earnestly asking or begging for something, beseeching someone to give, to provide something specific. That's supplication. But then is it the same as prayer? If yes, then why prayer and supplication? If it's the same, it should be prayer or supplication. Do you understand the dilemma? Show me with your hand if you think prayer and supplication is the same. It's not? Then what's the difference? Well, prayer in the Hebrew language is a word that comes from the verb palal, which means judgment. Yes, prayer has to do with judging. Mm -hmm. Yes, because the word for prayer in the Hebrew language comes from the same root indicating that prayer is actually a sort of a self Judgment, self-evaluation, self-assessment in God's presence. You remember when God speaks to the prophet Isaiah, he says, Come now, let us reason together. What does that mean? Well, God is calling you, God is calling me to sit down and reason together. And as I sit in front of God, reasoning with Him, there's a sort of self-evaluation, self-assessment, self-judgment, if you want so, going on. Because that's the essence of prayer. And when you look at what Daniel, Daniel does here in chapter 9, that's exactly what he does. He does prayer first. He does this self-assessment, this self-judgment, this self-evaluation, not only for him, for himself, but also for his people. And it goes on saying from, from verse 4, Daniel 9 verse 4, And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confessions and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy, Mercy here is chesed. It's the same word used for love, loving kindness. Who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Verse 5. We have sinned and committed iniquity. Who? Including you, Daniel? We have. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Verse 6. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers, and all the people of the land. Verse 7. 
O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us. To whom? To us. Like including you, Daniel? Mm -hmm. But to us, shame of face, as it is this day. To the man of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you, it may seem that he's drifting now into third person, plural. No, he's coming back to first, plural, verse 8. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face. To whom? Again, it's you? It's you too? To our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against Him. Can you see what He's doing? Verse 9. Verse 10. <clears throat> we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. We have not obeyed, you have not either. To walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. 11. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us. Because, what's the reason? Why did that happen? Again, we have sinned against Him. And He has confirmed His words, which He spoke against us and against our judges who judge us, by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet, again, same problem. We have not made our prayer. But Daniel, I thought you were a prayer warrior. Wasn't he? Haven't we seen him going back to prayer again and again when something was going wrong? Yes, we have. And yet he says, we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Verse 14. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does though we have not obeyed his voice. Wow. After you read this several times, over and over, you really come to the conclusion, this guy, Daniel, is not the one we thought he was. If he's one of those, if he's a sinner among sinners, then what a sinner really among sinners. I don't have too much time to spend on intercessory prayer. But this is what I want to emphasize. If you do intercessory prayer and somebody hears your intercession and you come across or you sound as if you were such a sinless person and all those others were so sinful. Something might be wrong with your prayer of intercession. Please notice how Daniel becomes an exponent of sinners. He does that self-assessment, self-evaluation, not only of his own life, but the life of his people. Because in the Bible, there's always a corp corporate personality. 
And I want to emphasize this a little bit because sometimes I have, I have the impression in this individualistic world we live in, we all have the impression, yeah, you know, this church, you know, this Laguna Niguel, SDA, yeah, so many problems, but I, I'm not like them. I'm so much different. If you knew how different I was, when really the example of somebody that does intercession for his people is we have. It is us. It is our. I'm part of the problem. Because as long as I'm not part of the problem, I cannot have somebody else from the outside come and solve the problem. I have the impression I am the Savior. I'm here making all the difference. Had it not been for me, then you would have seen. Mm -mm. If your intercession places you in a position of sinlessness as opposed to everybody that is so sinful, something may be wrong with your intercessory prayer. But after compassion, confession, after confession, there is a time for petition. And Daniel makes a petition. Look at the soft transition between his prayer and now he moves towards supplication. So this far it was prayer. Now he moves into supplication. Verse 15, And now, O Lord, our God who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and made yourself a name as it is this day. He still goes back a little bit. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. But, 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 but let's move forward, Lord. Verse 16. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Verse 17, now therefore, O God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. See, again, the two concepts, prayer and supplications. And for the Lord's sake, for whose sake? The word there is Yahweh, for Yahweh's sake. Cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Verse 18. 18. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations. And the city which is called by your name, for we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Yes, it's not because of our righteousness. It's because of your great mercies. Verse 19, look how beautiful. O Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God. For your city and your people are called by your name. Verse 20. Now, while I was speaking. Oh, the answer comes right away, right away. He had his supplication before he had his self-evaluation and the evaluation of his people, and while he's still speaking, while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God, of my God, verse 21, yes, while I was speaking, he emphasizes it, he was still speaking in prayer. The man Gabriel, 
whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, or a better translation, whom I have seen in the vision at the beginning or the earlier time, the earlier vision. Where was that vision? It was in chapter 8. Being caused to fly swiftly reached me about the time of the evening offering, verse 22. And he, that is Gabriel, informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Understand what? At the beginning of your supplications, the command or the word, the davar, went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Has he seen any vision in chapter 9? In chapter 9? Up to this point? No. The explanation he's receiving now, or the revelation he's receiving now, is about the vision he saw in chapter 8, right? And what was the trouble in chapter 8? He was trying to understand the 2,300 evening mornings, but he couldn't. Nobody could understand. More than that, he fainted. He fainted and for days he was sick. And for years coming, he was still thinking about his mind would go back again and again to that same reality presented in the vision with the little horn trampling upon the saints and the sanctuary. And then at the question, Admatai, until when? The answer was 2,300 evening mornings. What is that about? And here we are, verse 24, the explanation starts. It says, 70 weeks. How many? 70 weeks are determined, and the Hebrew language there is actually cut off. I would like to invite my assistant preacher to help me show what this really means, what it means to cut off, he should have a saw, because there's no other way to cut this piece off. So, it says that 70 weeks are cut off. Okay, let's cut it off. That's the 70 weeks there. Okay, go for it. Uh huh. Yeah, it's happening now. Uh huh. Okay, practice, practice, practice makes perfect. But you understand the concept here, right? So you have a big piece, a big chunk, and the first seventy weeks are cut off for Daniel's people. Who's Daniel's people? Who? The Jews, right? And your holy city, what is his city? Jerusalem. For what? These 70 weeks are cut off for one reason. To deal with sin. To finish the transgression. To make an end of sins. To make reconciliation for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. I don't have time to enter into details with each concept here, but he gave up. <laughs> you're good. You, 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 you're a better preacher, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you got, you got the concept, right? May I have it? So you, you got the concept. There's this piece up to, up to this point here, right? This piece here, that is for Daniel's people, for Daniel's city. But then, the explanation goes on, verse 25, 25. 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Oh, there's a date. There's a starting point for this. There's a starting point. The starting point is that word, that decree that goes out to build, to restore Jerusalem. And in history, that's 457 B.C. until the Messiah, the Prince. Who's the Messiah, the Prince? Jesus Christ, obviously. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall, even in trouble sometimes. So again, this concept of seven weeks, 62 weeks, seven plus 62, how much is that? 69 weeks, and the total is 70 weeks. And the concept of weeks comes back again and again. It's about weeks. What weeks? Are those weeks of days? Like each week is seven days? Well, let me show you something from the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 8. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of... How do, you, how do you normally count Sabbaths? By the years or by the day? Day or years? Uh, usually you count Sabbaths by the day. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven day is a Sabbath day. A day of rest. Right? For everybody. But... In the Bible, there's a way of counting Sabbaths by the years. Seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. Oh yeah, in the Bible, there's a different kind. Additionally, in addition to the seven days week, there's a seven years week. At the end of a seven years week, there is a Sabbath year or a sabbatical year. And in that year, the land would not be tilled. They would not cultivate the soil. The land would have to rest, right? But then there's something else. Seven times seven years. What is that? Seven times seven. Forty-nine years. Forty-nine years, and at the end of the forty-nine years, there is what they called a year of jubilee. A year of jubilee. Wow, interesting. But here in Daniel 9, we do not have a seven-day week. We do not have a seven-year week. We do not have a seven time seven year week, we have a 70 time seven years. And that's very interesting because it seems that we have this pattern and there is a way of counting 490 until a super duper jubilee, which has to deal with sin. And when that 70 weeks is up, then that super-duper jubilee steps in about which Jesus was preaching in Luke chapter 4. You may remember when he said, I came to give the good news a year of jubilee or freedom, letting the captives free. Uh, interesting. So those 490, the first 490, were for the Jews. Seven weeks for first, seven, this is first piece here. Then 62 up to this point. And then you have a little section here, which is the final week. I will need this magnifying glass for that because it's pretty hard to see everything that's in there. We are moving to the next verse, verse 27. Then he shall confirm 
a covenant with many for one week. For one week. Look a little bit in the previous verse. See how it's connected. Verse 26. After the 62 weeks, which finishes here, Messiah shall be cut off. The Messiah, who's the Messiah? Jesus Christ, being cut off, that alludes to his sacrifice, to his crucifixion, but not for himself, but for whom, if not for himself? For the sins of the people. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who is that prince that shall, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary? Who destroyed the city and the sanctuary in Jerusalem? In uh, AD 70, the Romans. The end of it shall be with a flood. And uh, till the end of the world, desolations are determined. So the word desolation is used here. Look how in verse 27 it appears again. Because he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, right here in the middle of the week, I don't know if you can see, there is a cross in the middle of that week. Can you see that? No, you can't. Let's see it on screen there. Oh, it's there. See? It's the same. It's the same. And those fingers there are not my fingers. That's Mike Morton. So, uh, right in the middle you have the cross. In the middle of the week. Move it a little back so we can see what else happens there. Verse 27. So, in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offerings. How? By his own sacrifice. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, again, desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate or desolator. There's a discussion whether... It should be desolate or desolator. But the concept is there. So now go back to that picture with the magnifying glass. See those dates. The last week out of the 70. Year 27. What happened in year 27? Jesus was baptized. How long was Jesus' earthly ministry? Three years and a half. See how seven is cut in the middle? Three years and a half. That's why you have the cross right in the middle. Year what? 31. And then you have the end of that last week in year 34. Again, I'm not going to go into details here. But I want us to notice something very interesting. How those 70 weeks, the first 70 weeks of the 2,300 evening mornings are lined up, 7 plus 62 plus 1, which is 70, and how there are specific details in each case so that we are not lost when we want to go to it and interpret it. But now I have a question. If we know 457 B.C. is the starting point for the 70 weeks, what is the starting point for the 2,300 evening mornings? What is it? Same date, right? Because this piece is cut off of this entire chunk. Right? So we know where it starts. But now listen to the question. Do we count from here, from 457 BC, years or days? Days or years? Why? Why? Because if the weeks were weeks of years, it would make sense to continue counting years. 
instead of switching back and forth between years and days. And please notice that this is just a demonstration that the year-day principle or day-year principle you may know from prophecy is valid. We often rely on two Bible verses from the book of one from the book of Numbers, one from the book of Ezekiel when it comes to that principle. And many people have an issue with that, saying that, ah, that may not refer to prophecy in the sense we interpret prophecy. And I say, all right. I prove the same principle the other way around. Moving from the principle of seven years, seven years, seven weeks of years, and then 70 weeks of years, which proves that if this segment is counted in years, this rest of it has to be counted the exact same way if we are to be consistent in our way of interpretation. Does that make sense? So you can take those verses out of the Bible, those two verses. Don't take it. Don't take them out, but I'm just sharing the concept. You can take them out, and yet the principle of interpretation will still be there in the Bible based on this prophecy. But here's the thing. If we start counting from 457 B.C., where do we stop? What year? What? 1844. Are you sure? Have you done your math? If you've done your math, you should be 1840. 40, 3 or 5? Oh, there's a problem with the zero year there. Okay, so you have to, because there's no year zero in history, you have to count out or eliminate one year. That's what's going to take you exactly to 144. And you would say, ah, you know, again, here we go again. Specific Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. Explained in the same way. No, no, I was explaining it the other way around. I didn't use the day-year principle based on those Bible verses. I came the other way around. But the question is, what is going on in history starting with 1844? And now we have some uh, jargons again, Seventh-day Adventist jargons that we use. Most of the time, we don't know what it means. How do we then want others to understand us? So I think it's important to rely on what the Bible passages say. Remember the word desolation was used again and again at the end of uh, verses 26 and 27 in chapter 9? Did we find the same word somewhere else? Yes, we did. Where? Look, Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. How long? Admatai. Until when will the vision be concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? The giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. Ah, desolation appears here again. But this thing here is not happening here in AD 70 when the temple is destroyed and the sanctuary is destroyed, the one in Jerusalem, the physical temple and city of Jerusalem. It's happening all the way down here at 1844, which means that the same power the same power that did the desolation of Jerusalem at that time and destroyed the sanctuary at that time in AD 70, the same kind of power, why? Because the little horn comes out of the fourth beast, the fourth beast representing Rome, 
The same power does the desolation all the way down through history until the time when it finally stops. And we've seen based on the prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 how that works. It starts, it has year, years, and half of year, but at one point it stops. But based on the book of Revelation, there is a piece, a small piece, that will come back at one point. Where will it come back? We don't know exactly toward the end, because its end will be brought by the heavenly court that appears in chapter 7, where the supreme judge or justice, God himself, sits in the middle, and around him there's this heavenly court of justices, probably representatives of the unfallen worlds, and they do justice on behalf of the saints, and dominion and kingdom is taken from the little horn that does trespass and uh, trample upon the saints. Again, here at the end, dominion and kingdom is taken from the little horn and given to the saints. The saints. In the language of uh, Daniel chapter 8, the sanctuary is being cleansed, verse 14, 8, 14. And he said to me, for 2,300 days or evening mornings, that's the biblical concept, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And if you look what happened in the sanctuary, in the earthly dispensation of the sanctuary, when there was a sanctuary in Jerusalem and the priests would perform their duties there, there was a daily service, the Tamid, and there was the Yom Kippur service. When the Yom Kippur service happened, the daily still continued. So it means that starting with 1844, Jesus Christ does not only do the Tamid, the Tamid that has been trampled upon or underfoot by the little horn throughout history, he also takes on the Yom Kippur kind of service on behalf of the saints. What does that mean? Well, I shared last week that the Yom Kippur service was a time of justice again. That's why you have the courtroom scene and the sanctuary cleansing scene together. There's a time of justice when the sins that were confessed and forgiven were taken from that storehouse, so to speak, of sins from the Holy of Holies, put on the head of Azazel's goat, and Azazel would pay for those sins. Those that did not confess their sins, therefore their sins were not forgiven, they would have the same fate as Azazel's goat. So in the end, it's obviously something going on that separates the saints from those that are not qualified as saints. How? You've heard the concept of uh, deliberation and then execution before. Why is that deliberation even needed? We use a, a different term in classical jargon. I'm not going to use it just because I don't want to put anybody to sleep. But that deliberation is very meaningful. Why? Just imagine this. Imagine, I should have a long stick. No, I don't have it. Where is it? Oh, in the corner. There's a long stick in the corner. Could you please give me that long stick? You know, I used to be a high school teacher at one point. So this is a high school scenario. The teacher speaks to the high school student. Thank you so much and tells him, uh, can you please be the student for me? <laughs> and tells him, uh, listen, uh, Sean, when we have break, would you please open those windows 
so we can get some fresh air? You would do that, right? Yeah, but you can't reach them. They are too high, so you'll have to use this. Okay? And now we have the break. And Sean, with the stick in his hand, moves toward the window, but a colleague trips him up. He lets go of the stick, and what happens to the window? And now, he and the guy that tripped him up, they're looking at one another, who did it? Who did it? Well, his friends would say, the other guy did it. He tripped him up, right? But the other guy's friends will say, no, no, no. He did it. He had the stick in his hand. So who did it? Thank you. Who did it? In order for you to know who did it, you would need what? A judge. The principal of the school comes and uh, asks some questions, does some deliberations. What would the, be the word that you would use in classical jargon? Oh, okay. So he does some deliberation and because somebody has to pay for the window. Now, in best case scenario, the guy that tripped him up, should come out, do what? Confess, okay, we sinned, okay, and because God is mercy, what would God do? The school will pay for it, right? But what if he doesn't come out? Would it be fair, would it be just for the guy, the other guy, the one that had the stick, but didn't have the intention of breaking the window, would it be fair for him to pay for the window? No. But you may think, okay, but can God just fix that window and let it go? Well, let's imagine a scenario in which that's what he does. He just lets it go. Yeah, but Satan is also in the equation. Theoretically, if Satan was not there, then God would have the latitude to do whatever he wanted to do about it. Just let it go. And yet, even if Satan was not there, God is love. Is God love? What does it mean that God is love? Well, in the Bible, it means, in the language of John, we saw His glory, glory of Jesus, as the glory of the only begotten Son, of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Love is grace and truth. In other language, it's mercy and justice. And that's exactly what Daniel chapter 7 and 8 speak about. There is a time where this deliberation part of divine justice, followed then by execution at the very end, starts happening, not against the saints, but in favor of the saints. And yes, the little whore, no matter how strong he was in history or would be in the final segment of history, in the end, the minion is taken by the court and given back to the saints. That's the plan of God handling sin and bringing salvation to you and to me. Amen.